talked a little bit today about women in leadership. And so um, you all have been introduced to the social change model of leadership that works on this idea that leadership is about the individual and includes consciousness of self. Are you aware of what you believe? Congruence, do your actions and behaviors match? And commitment, what do you care deeply about? And the self group uh, part. And then the model moves into the group connections. How do you collaborate? How do you find common purpose? Can you have controversy with civility? Um, and then all of that connects to citizenship and that small c citizenship. Are you a citizen of the world? Um, do you seek chances to find commonalities with people as much as differences? And if all those circles are connected, the self, the group, and the community, um, that's when true social change happens. So this study is a worldwide study, as I mentioned, with over 300,000 college student respondents from all different kinds of universities. Um, um, and it has affected 250 different institutions looking at how our college students prepared for social change, leadership for social change, and how they enact that. And I briefly introduced you to the research team. I want to point out again, uh, the principal investigator of this study is John Dugan at Loyola University of Chicago. And the co-principal investigator is Dr. Susan Kumabess from University of Maryland. She's emeritus at University of Maryland. And my personal dissertation advisor, so she, she's my mentor here. And then we have a nice array of other doctoral students that are part of this project. Um, there are a bunch of different frameworks. We started this to look at leadership, but we actually found it connects to a whole bunch of different kinds of work. So you really see social psychology and human development in some of the questions we ask, critical and justice-based perspectives. Um, so we find that there's dimensions of servant leadership, transformational leadership, authentic leadership, emotionally intelligent leadership. All of that is packed into the things we're going to talk about in the next 10 minutes here or so here. So here's the conceptual framework. If those of you are research uh, folks, this is be of interest to you. And um, in college, you're like, how do you measure what college does for you? Um, what the first thing we have to do is, are you all here because um, you were so excited about this class, or were there things before you came to college that affected your ability or interest in this course? So we have to figure out like your demographics, your beliefs before college about leadership and change, your own levels of community engagement before college, and then we do statistically, we take all that out as so we're able to make claims about the effects that college has on people's outcomes. Does that make sense? So I just measured you now, then we would say, oh, look at all these amazing change agents we've created. But really, we did, some of you were, most of you were very active before you got to this experience at George Mason University, right? So we statistically can able to account for that. And we also learned that there's, it's not just your courses that happen in college, it's also what you do outside of the classroom, your student organizations, your real lives, your families, um, and also maturation effects. So we know that also, especially if you're traditional age college students, you're changing. So we try to take all that into account before we make the claims they're gonna make on the data. Um, I'm not gonna go over this, but you all will have these slides, and I'll give these slides to the WELL program as well. But these are our definitions for some of the words I'm gonna talk about. So yes, it does really matter how you define leadership. Um, so when we use these data, make sure you're talking about leadership as people who work collaboratively for the purpose of making positive social change. Not a common definition of leadership, but leadership is about commanding and controlling other people, right? So we have a very particular approach to leadership and leadership development and leadership capacity and efficacy and all of that. So you'll have these terms to check out later as well. So you guys ready to take a little quiz? I think this is, data is most fun. I find that almost any group, I do this youth, I do this with seniors, but um, data can be really fun when it's done in a sort of interactive way. So um, you all heard, these are the values of the social change model, these eight C words. And so the question for you is, of this huge group of 300,000 college students taken over the last 10 years, this data, which of the following um, leadership values the students scored the highest, and which do you think they scored the lowest? Does anybody want to make a guess about what they think students scored highest on out of these eight C words? Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Like, what's the demographic of the students? So um, I should, I do have all that, I can give that to you. The demographic for this is, um, because the sample is so large, it's mostly traditional age, so pretty much 18 to 21 year old, although we do have adult learners. It's mostly four-year institutions, although we do have two-year institutions and those kinds of things. Um, um, the race and ethnicity vary on where the universities are, so actually we have a really nice pool of diverse learners. We have 50 transgender people in our study um, because we, are one of, we think we have the like, national transgender database because we have sampled so many different universities. Um, so that's an important question to ask. But what do you think, given a traditional uh, U.S. college population, what do you think students were highest on? Anybody want to be under? 
or lowest? Which one do you think we're worst at? Oh, yes, David. I'd probably say worse at consciousness of self. Oh, okay. Self-awareness? Okay, consciousness of self. Do you know what your gifts and strengths are? Do you know the areas you need to work on? Do you know what your values are, your spiritual development, all of that kind of stuff? Okay. That is the one that changes most in college. So we actually, we know uh, what uh, Rupa was saying is that people actually shift and grow over time. And so we see the biggest jump in that from when we do longitudinal studies from freshman to senior. You're gonna say something, Juanita? Oh yeah, I was gonna say um, probably like conscious versus like middle school. Yes. Um, as like the higher you go, like the more you can like be aware of yourself. Oh, interesting. Or, it's the highest or lowest, but it's even the highest <laughs> just because like when you get into college, like everything changes. Yes. And like so many different things affect you, mm -hmm. and so especially for freshmen, like they get really stressed, so they could be like drinking a lot, they could be like stressed a lot, which causes a lot of problems. Yes. So it's not, so it's just a big thing, whether it's the highest or like the lowest, it's still yeah. like a major thing that students go through. This is the one that students come in the lowest with. So actually, so I talked about how self is the biggest change over time. The students sort of consistently score fairly low on their comfort with disagreeing. Would you all agree with that? I think we've talked a lot about that in this class. Especially there's gender implications of that as well. Um, if you are a pleaser or nice, nice girls don't. Remember we read some of those pieces. Um, so how do we disagree and disagree with still with integrity and um, those kinds of things? Yeah. In the reading for today, it yes. said that, um, that the races also affect. That's all that's in those yes. demographics. So like it feels like the HBC, maybe yes. their strengths would be like change, collaboration, and controversy. You're gonna get an A plus on the rest of this quiz. I'll show you, I've got the reading tables, I'll show you in a minute. So that's great, thank you, Uja. Um, so here is what we found. And this you could have shocked, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was stunned, uh, many of you are stunned. But commitment overall was the highest of students coming in. Now again, this is all this data is since 2006, so it's in the last 10 years. So millennials, think about millennial generation characteristics. But you guys are committed deeply to things, you care deeply about your involvement. You care deeply about what schooling means to you um, and what you want to do with your life. <coughs> um, my generation, the Gen Xers, uh, were seen as cynical and dis dis uh, unattached, disaffected, kind of, right? So when I came in as a Gen Xer researcher looking at this, I'm like, commitment, right? Because <laughs> uh, that would not have been true 20 years ago. Um, so you all are believers um, more than doubters. There's some language about that, some research about that. But look at where you have lowest. What's lowest there? change. So why do you think college students are lowest? And it's really comfort with change, not necessarily ability to create change, but comfort with change. So why do you think you're less comfortable with change? <laughs> Is it because with change like comes like the unknown and it's kind of like you want to be grounded, so yeah. you want to hold on to everything that you know. Yeah, and you don't want to like what? It's almost like the polar end of commitment, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. So as you're coming in, this is where college students are scoring. You can see it's not a big differentiation, um, but we know the larger your sample, the smaller differences make matter. So um, we have lots of things are significant because our sample's so huge, but we have to calculate something called effect size, which shows that it really make an impact. And so these all have large effect sizes as well. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. So the change part, does that also have to do with like, are the millennials involved in government, or I guess not? Oh, excellent. We're going to talk about that in class on Thursday, about political and generational effects of political involvement. But yes, and actually, though, what I found is um, there's a new story being written about political involvement. So the latest data from Circle, which is the group that studies uh, U.S. Um, youth uh, activism and, and political involvement, said that African-American girls, so young women, are the biggest voting block right now, more than any other uh, youth vote. It's um, African-American young women who are getting out there in political participation. Isn't that so different than kind of the story we tell ourselves, right? So there's a new story to be written about political involvement. We'll talk about that All right, so here's, um, we're, we're, this is a class about women in leadership. So let's get into gender implications of some of this research. Um, so what do you think, again, Tyler's like, I don't know about this. <laughs> so what do you think female college students score significantly higher across all eight leadership values? Again, those same C words from before. 
do you think women score significantly higher? How many people say yes? Raise your hand high. Okay, three, four, five, six, half. Okay, how many people say no? Is anyone willing to say no? So that everybody else is going to say, okay, Hannah says maybe not, maybe not. Um, any rationales? What do you guys think? So this is actually a trick question. Uh, that's what researchers do. <laughs> Women scored higher on seven out of the eight characteristics. So we um, scored higher on our um, capacity to enact these values. Um, on all of them, you can't see this graphic, but on everything that changed. Interesting, right? So women scored higher on conscious of self, congruence, commitment, collaboration, common purpose, conversation, ability, and citizenship. That's for higher change. But the real story in the gender part of this data is the right side table, which talks about this concept called leadership efficacy. So what is efficacy? Yes, there's such a belief that you can get it done, right? So efficacy is, is um, it's different than self-confidence. Self-confidence is what you call a generalized construct, which means I have a general level of self-confidence, but efficacy is the fancy language is domain specific. So I might be really confident um, that I can write a paper that have low efficacy that I can run a marathon. That's me personally, right? <laughs> um, and some people have the opposite, right? So this is efficacy for leadership. So what do you make of this? That women are really scoring higher in capacity on seven of the eight C's, but lower in confidence and efficacy um, than men. What do y'all think? Thoughts? <laughs> yes, Kelly. I think it's because, like, we, well, women don't have that, like, not that we don't have, but we don't express as much self-advocacy. The, I know I can, I believe I can, I'm going to do this, nice. as men do probably, mm -hmm. so. That maybe that's why we sort of lower that. Yeah, so there is a story that men, women might hold back a little bit. We read the Ophelia effect and some of the stuff about um, young um, girls' development that might affect how people come to leadership later in life as well. Yeah, I think it has to do a lot with women's experience of internalized oppression in the society and how even though we um, can do well in so many things, we can't actually take ownership of that. Yes. The society has taught us. Yeah, so society pre pre presents women as objects or decorative or in these um, um, less central kinds of roles, potentially. And therefore, sometimes we might start believing that. Um, so we internalize those beliefs and potentially they hold us back. Thank you for a great point about internalized oppression. So we see this difference. So the question that I ask, because I'm really interested in what do you do about it? So what do you do about it? And there's two things you have to do about it. One is we need to raise the efficacy of men for leadership. So to some extent, this might be a genderized model, right? So if you think of stereotypically um, gender biases or gender um, approaches, you might think collaboration, caring, and some of these other things are more feminine kinds of characteristics. So we need to teach men about how to achieve more confidence in some of these skills around congruence and commitment. But the most important stuff, we also need to raise women's efficacy for leadership. So how do you make someone feel more capable of doing leadership? How do you do that? How do you make someone, because what we know is from the data, we've started doing path models, which are very interesting. If, even if you outscore everybody on the, I have the capacity, if you don't have the efficacy, you don't enact the behavior. So I'm never gonna act on it, even if I have every knowledge and skill in the world, if I don't believe I'm capable, yeah? So um, how do we raise efficacy? How do you make someone feel more capable of leadership? Yeah, Maggie. I mean, to me, the simplest thing is just praise them. Let them know it's like, hey, you can do this. You were absolutely, I mean, this might not have to do directly with leadership, but I didn't get a job yesterday. Oh, not, sorry. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sad as you, but like, I was telling my friend, I was like, no, you have been amazing at the job. You have been great. You know, you find a job like that. I mean, I have a text. It's like, it's like thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, and it was just like, okay, you know, I can still do this, even though I didn't get the job for, because I, the job was different because I was branching out into like a different, mm -hmm. like something I wasn't familiar in. A new like, field. But, yeah, a new field, exactly. So it's like, okay, this would be perfect because they don't really require the experience I would need for other mm -hmm. jobs. Like, okay, I'm nervous and branching out. And even though I didn't get it, it's like she was like, no, you're doing great. I think you'd be a wonderful disposition. Like, okay, so it encouraged me to keep looking in that field and not just give up and go back to what I'm comfortable in. That's great. So affirmation. Yeah. Then affirmation can come from peers. 
from other adults. It can come from all different kinds of places. Um, and one of our lifespan studies shows that affirmations actually shift. It starts as being the importance of parents and external authorities really matter. And then as you enter college, peer affirmation, which is your story, Maggie, becomes the most important thing. The other thing I heard in your story is developing resilience skills. Yeah. So you tried and didn't work out, but you're going to go back and try for another position. And so not being afraid to fail forward or bounce back from that. And there's all kinds of emerging research about resilience and important leadership skill. So thank you. So that's one way um, that people would be, would be um, affirmations. What do you think, Whitney? Um, one thing that we talk about with like young life stuff a lot is like holding your crown over their head and watching them grow into it. Oh, so nice. like you're casting vision onto their life and telling them who they are and who they can become. Great. And that's like, a great way of encouraging people and telling them like, hey, you are capable of being like who you want to be and reaching your goals and like growing into this incredible person. Like, that's beautiful. Yeah, I love the metaphor, right? And once you have a beautiful visualization, you can see it happening. Yeah. So that's wonderful. We also know that modeling, so I know that you all have found amazing mentors and role models just in this classroom, but also through the, some of the interviews that you've done with amazing predecessors, instigators, and inheritors of women's and gender justice. Um, but modeling after someone, seeing how someone go before you and be successful is another way to build efficacy. So finding people not only you put into you, but also that you aspire to be like is one of the gateway things. Um, there's also, this all comes from Albert Bandura's work about how do you build efficacy. And one of the um, other ones is called inactive mastery, which is a fancy language. But what is inactive mastery? It's, uh, I know, it's like, what is this fancy psychology term? It basically means trying it out. So having some places where it's safe to try on leadership, um, even if it's not successful. So, um, um, so it could be running a student organization and maybe not having something go so well, but learning how to bounce back from that. And we do a lot of case studies, right? Case studies are helpful ways to try on what we might think would work um, um, and see if that would actually be what we want to do in the real world. So all of those in active mastery. So again, affirmations and active mastery are trying it out. Um, we've got um, role modeling and having models and mentors. So all those things matter. And there's more and more stuff written about that. Yeah. And maybe I can say uh, from my own um, yeah. story, you know, what is uh, driving me to uh, work there is no sources, there is no funding, nothing. But I think what is drawing me is something bigger than me. Yes. It's, not, it's not about me. It is about thinking, wow, if, if it's possible to connect millions of students, how we can change them? <laughs> this is so huge, you know? It, is, uh, it comes from this drive. And also, with, and I think that is my calling. This is, that is why I'm here. This is the reason I'm in on the earth. This is something I want. This is my legacy. Yes. It is something very, very strong in your heart, and it's a uh, some kind of selfless drive. You know, it's, I, 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 no matter I get money or position, it's not doesn't matter for me. It's something I want. Community, they have to be done, <laughs> and I do it until I die. And so that is nothing to stop me. If you have something like that, you can move the mountain, and you said you, you continue until you die. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's life and death. So it's, if I don't know, if we don't have any funding. I don't know how, but I don't think about how. I think of what, and I'm focusing on what I want to accomplish. What is what is I want? And how it is it's a during step by step, so you it, it, it just the way is uh, the path is open, you know, you find and it's, it's like adventure. <laughs> it does, you know, you just meet this and this and this come, things come to you. I don't know what, how, but it, it, it comes because it's something I have to do. It is my own experiences. That is, uh, that is some drive me and have a good book I say. That's a beautiful story of calling and then there's some people who write about this thing called the BHAG. Has anybody heard of the BHAG? It's the big, hairy, audacious goal. And that's what you're talking about is you have this goal that seems almost impossible um, but it's so inspiring, compelling that not only are you motivated by it but your passion for it attracts other people to the charge. Um, and so there is something about that if you have this deep commitment others are inspired by that and want to join forces. And so that's some of that complexity leadership that we've talked about is how that happens. Is ideas are actually, and people are attractors, not just organizations and jobs and stuff. So I thank you for bringing in those notions of calling and all of that. I think that's a huge part of this. Um, on campus is what this can look like. Is I had a group of students at the University of Maryland who I thought they were kind of silly, but they decided they were going to create a program called 
someone caught you doing leadership. <laughs> Did I tell you about this already? And so um, they decided that so many women are actually doing all of these things, but they don't think of it as leadership. And so they said, what we're going to do is we're going to find sort of quiet leaders or people who um, are doing, you know, are very committed and collaborative, um, and we're going to tell them they're leaders. And what we're going to do is we're going to give them a balloon and a note card. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know if this is going to work. It seems a little cheesy to me, maybe. Oh my gosh, uh, but I let them, you know, it doesn't hurt, it was 100 bucks to give them a small budget to go. They started peppering campus with going into meetings, seeing people in classes, and finding that quiet person who was making a difference and celebrating them. And all of a sudden, people were like, I want a balloon, how do I, how do I get a note card? They liked the recognition part of someone caught them during leadership. And some people may not have thought of themselves as leaders um, did. So the first day of this class, Kim and I asked you, um, do you consider yourself a leader? And some of you found that question really hard. And it's probably this, right? You probably already have these capabilities within you, but maybe have low efficacy. And so hopefully through some of the things we've studied and worked on in our conversations, I hope that next week you're leaving this class feeling more confident and capable, I know, in your, in your leadership abilities. <laughs> so any other thoughts on this interesting gender finding? Okay. We're going to keep going a bit. I might skip a little bit. But here, I do want to get the race data. We talked a lot here about intersectionality and how gender and culture and sexual orientation and ability and all of these things sort of shape how someone approaches leadership. So what do you think, which racial group scored higher on conscious of self, collaboration, and who should knows already? <laughs> who do you think it was and change? It was our African-American students. Um, who are scoring higher on each of those dimensions. And what's nice about this is we often treat um, folks of different racial identities from a deficit model, um, and we hold that people who look a certain way. And so we love this, especially of this more collectivist approach to leadership. It makes sense um, that certain communities do this better than others. And so really there's a big story about where the learning needs to happen, is how do we honor um, um, that we have other things to learn from folks who do this work so much better. Thoughts on this race data? I'm going to come back. i got an even better chart in a minute about it. This is our old chart. Then we got something called a graphic designer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll show you what happened to how we start presenting this data. It becomes really exciting. Um, I'm going to quickly skim through this. But involvement matters. You saw that Gallup report, if you're engaged. But we still know that almost a quarter of students aren't involved in anything outside of the classroom. And so how are you finding time? Um, I think Mason's much different because many of you are working one or more jobs. Many of you have family responsibilities, you have community responsibilities. Um, but what we know is that even just one involvement makes a huge difference in your learning on these C dimensions. So our story is even just go to one thing. Just go to the well lecture, <laughs> and you're going to meet people there and get ideas that you hadn't before, which often are gateways. You know that involvement's like a gateway thing. <laughs> you try it once, and all of a sudden, you're overcommitted. <laughs> there is a declining part. Some of you are in 10,000 groups, <laughs> so you know, 100 groups. Um, there is, um, all of a sudden, there's a place where your well-being falls off, and you're not as effective as school. Community service. Almost half of our students do community service. Um, and yet we know that service is one of the most powerful drivers of this model and this kind of leadership that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, if this is a model about changing the world, actually practicing meeting the world, <laughs> um, it actually helps you develop on these dimensions. Let me say one final thing about this change phenomenon. So we saw that change when our students came in the lowest. What's interesting is that any marginalized group understood um, how to make change and was comfortable with change more than any group from a more privileged class. So why do you think that is? Why do um, gay and bisexual people understand change better than heterosexual? Why do first generation college students understand it better than non first generation college students? Why do students of color understand it better than white students? Why do two year students understand how to deal with change? What do you think? To me, this is really obvious, but were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say they break the normative. So they already know their existence and their identity is already breaking them. So they have to keep doing it. That's exactly it, right? So you've already been maybe victimized, or you know what it's like to not be in majority status. You know what it's like to have things done to you. And so you're constantly aware of um, what political realities might shift for you. You have to be aware of your own culture, but also all the other cultures out there, especially those that have different kinds of power and control some of the levers of the world. So um, the, again, another asset, how do we teach um, majority students to have a better understanding of this and how do we sort of lift up these messages. 
Now again, I'm very aware this is a Western approach to something that non-Western cultures have been doing forever. So I do think some of this is knowledge appropriation, where we've taken this model um, that we made in the US, but really it builds on what indigenous and collectivist cultures have known for a long time. So I want to honor them and we're going to talk about this briefly. So here's the final point I want to make, and then we will <laughs> move on. Um, one of the things we know about university settings is that um, there are different levers that make people capable of leadership, and so we want to think about how do we best spend our time with college students. And so which of these things do you think makes the biggest difference in students' leadership learning? Is it taking a position, so I'm the president of the blah, blah, blah organization? Is it faculty mentoring? I should just say faculty mentoring is one of the most impactful factors in the college student literature, college environments literature. Conversations across and about difference. Just being involved, we saw the effects of one involvement. Or what about service? So which of these do you think was the biggest predictor of leading for social change? What do you think? What do you think? Involvement. involvement. I would have thought that too. I would because we saw that yeah. it's not the answer, but I would have I was with you. I thought that as well. But just getting involved would, would actually invite some of these other things potentially, or these other conversations. What do you think? I think that's mentoring because it kind of gives them that like reassurance that they have that person to go to to give them not only Yes, yeah, so we just talked about all the levers of efficacy. Hopefully, if your faculty care and are good that you're getting that from them, that is not the answer either. We were stunned. Everybody thought faculty mentoring or involvement would be it. What do you think, Tilly? I think it's the, the discussion, the socio-political discussion, like sharing that narrative across uh, your many different perspectives, I think is really important and like the easiest way to um, get in that, well, learn about different values. Hands down, that was the answer. So well done. But so, so talking about and across difference leveraged all of those outcomes above and beyond any of these other things. So it didn't matter if I was president of my organization and had the world's best faculty mentor and did a thousand hours of community service. What really mattered is how much time I spent talking to people different than me. Which is why the WELL program is such a great example of bringing people together across cultures and nationalities. Which is why this class at George Mason, because of our structural diversity and just because of the experiences that you all have been vulnerable and brought to the table, all those interactions have happened. So these conversations about and across different is why we can almost, well, Kim won't like it, we can almost throw out the syllabus, <laughs> right? And, and just talk to each other and we know that's leveraging this kind of leadership. So um, again, if you're a researcher, um, You'll see it actually at the bottom, this is what our traditional um, um, regression tables look like, which is how you do prediction. But the strongest predictors in order for each of the C's even, number one, across the board, socio-political conversation. So mentoring and involvement, uh, or we're also up there with you guys. Um, but social political conversations, social political conversations, <laughs> socio-political conversations. Wow. So what we do on campus is to think, how do we do more of these? How do we make more spaces where people aren't afraid to get real and talk about what's really mattering? And this is where I was telling you that we met a graphic designer. <laughs> so you don't have to know statistics or look at all those tables I breeze by because this picture actually really represents um, all of that same data but in a much more usable format. So I love this to make it much more approachable. So if you can read this, these are the different levers that we're investigating and these are all the different cultural groups we reference, and if it's colorful, you know it's a significant predictor. So for white students, community service was a predictor of socially responsible leadership. That makes sense. If you care enough to be involved in your communities, um, then you're more likely to evidence socially responsible leadership. But interesting, for African American students, positional leadership was a negative predictor of socially responsible leadership. What do you make of that? So if I'm the president of the Black Student Alliance, it actually is probably inversely correlated with my commitment for social change. Hmm. That's some deep stuff. Um, and what we think is that actually reifies the traditional view of leadership, about leadership being about power and rewards and privileges. Um, and especially some communities, we heard stories when we interviewed people with the qualitative part of the study, when they stepped out, someone said, well, who do you think you are? Don't forget where you came from. So some of the stories about community even taking on a position could actually be negatively impacting. Now, the other negative was interesting, um, Asian, Asian Pacific, American Pacific Islanders, um, negative impact for off-campus involvement. So if I'm an APA, I am of Asian descent, and I'm working, 
I really involved my own communities, why that might be a negative predictor for leadership for social change. I think this step is juicy to think about. <laughs> Our beliefs is probably it actually decreases the amount of social cultural conversations. So if you live at home per se, um, and you are really active maybe in your church group and your local community, you might not be reaching outside of that as much. So it actually might limit the amounts of conversations you're having with people with really diverse other experiences. So that's the meaning I make of that. Um, we also found it really significant. You didn't see that on the race table, but that Asian students in the U.S. scored lower than most of the other racial groups on these seed questions. And we thought, well, this seems so weird because we have this model minority myth of many Asian Americans. And what we found was um, people far smarter than me did statistical analysis. And they actually found and proved that of this 300,000 college students sample, the Asian students were less likely to score on the scale. They had a much more moderate response rate. So most of their responses hugged around the middle. They weren't um, didn't have as much hubris as we white students and say, I'm the best, right? So a lot of their scores were moderated, and we actually got that published about how um, Asian heritage students might score differently on Likert scale. So that's an interesting kind of factor, even when we control for first generation and all of that kind of stuff. So we see all these powerful predictors, and look at the favorite is the purple. Everybody benefits from talking cost difference. So I think that's all I'm going to... Um, I'm going to do today. You all, is this the reading that we gave you last night? Okay. So uh, thank you for doing that. Um, there is a nice um, <coughs> uh, book that gives the insights for this report. All of this data is available on leadershipstudy.net, which is the website for the Multi Institutional Study of Leadership. So you can go on there and read our definitions for some of these terms that give ideas, critical questions to ask yourselves and your communities about how to enact some of this, um, and including the gender story and the efficacy story. And the latest story we're talking about is developmental readiness. Like, are people ready to have these conversations? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the part, exciting part of the most current data. Uh, but we continue to add this data set. We've gone in every three-year cycle. Um, but we do have this instrument in Spanish language translation, Canadian translation, Lithuania. So it's exciting that we're starting to get Australia, and we're trying to get it to other countries. Um, but hopefully this in information on leadership and gender and race and culture was interesting. Okay, thank you. <laughs>